What's up guys, UFC 252 just wrapped up and it was a pretty good card. We're going to start with that main event. Stipe Miocic defeats Daniel Cormier by decision and this fight was amazing. Probably one of the best heavyweight title fights of all time. Trilogy really lived up to the hype. Definitely the best trilogy in UFC history up to this point. And both guys came extremely prepared. Great adjustments by both fighters. And you saw a lot of elements from the first two fights mixed into this one. You saw the body shots. From Stipe early, you saw DC land that overhand right off the clinch when he gets that underhook. And Stipe still shows that vulnerability when he exits the clinch. He leaves his left hand down, which leaves an opening for an overhand right from DC. And that kept catching him or getting very, very close. And he really didn't make much adjustments other than when his corner, I think it was in the fourth round, his corner started to tell him, I'm glad there's no audience that were able to hear it, push him up against the cage. Don't just disengage. They kept telling him to push him up against the cage once they clinch up. He seemed to be the stronger fighter, even though DC weighed more than him, right? Because from the cage, DC cannot circle around and find that overhand right the same way. Stipe is going to be the one who's going to get out on top from the disengagement. So that was a great adjustment. Daniel Cormier did not reach for the hands, almost ever. Like the only time he ever did, he poked Stipe in the eye. What was it, first round or something? But he kept his elbows in tight, and just as we expected, he had a hard time with the reach. Just like I talked about in the prediction video, just because he's making an adjustment does not mean it's the best result. It's the best thing to go with. Because of what Javier Mendez was talking about, got to bring in the elbows in tight to the body so the body shots won't land cleanly. If he, in fact, does that, it's going to be harder for him to get into Stipe his reach without grabbing onto his hands and hand fighting and the jab was catching him the right hand was catching him more than ever before because of that he stayed at Stipe's reach almost the entire fight the only real time he was getting in close on Stipe were he was landing some good jabs from a distance he showed his hand speed but mostly it was Stipe coming in close on DC and that's when they start exchanging with each other there were good leg kicks Stipe got really good leg kicks on DC in that fight really good body shots that jab to the body he would fake like he's gonna go up high after catching DC with a few jabs to the head and he would just go to the body push him away and they'll ultimately make DC work his way back to that same distance. And that pivot cross, man. The guy is probably the best pivot cross in the game. Stipe Miocic's right hand is so precise. But I am extremely shocked at how DC was able to take so many of the right hands. He got dropped once in the fight by those right hooks that kept catching him. And DC, I guess, is right when he says he doesn't go out or get dropped by one punch. Unless you're Rumble Johnson and John Jones. It's the consecutive punches that really get to him. And he is right about it, man. The guy's chin is abnormal. He takes a single shot so well. As does Stipe Miocic. I mean, look at me right hooks Stipe took on the chin. He got stunned in the first round, but then never really got stunned the same the entire fight, even though he was getting hit clean. And man, when that first eye poke happened, I was like, man, this is not good. They talked to the ref. There's history with this eye poke in DC's fights. But then it went back at him. And Stipe actually got DC worse than DC poked Stipe. I see some people on social media saying, you know, it's it's revenge or, you know, it's payback and how does he feel and all that stuff. I don't know if DC has to get surgery or something happened to his eye because it looked pretty bad. Hopefully nothing like that happens, but... It seems like he is going to stick to his retirement. DC retired at 41 years old. Fought the heavyweight champion three times. You know, he fought John Jones. He fought so many great fighters in this sport. He's definitely one of the all-time great fighters to ever compete in MMA. He may not be the best. He might not be the best heavyweight of all time or anything like that. But he's definitely on that top five, top ten list. No matter where you look at it. Light heavyweight, heavyweight, or greatest of all time across all weight classes. And also a great ambassador of the sport, as well as great commentator, great analyst, just a fun personality. And I'm very much looking forward to him being involved in the MMA community, just as he's been doing outside of fighting. And as for Stipe Miocic, it's cemented. I believe he goes past Fedor pretty clearly now, right? Greatest heavyweight of all time. Defended in his belt again after winning it twice. He goes and defends it again against Daniel Cormier. I mean, look at the names on his resume. Daniel Cormier twice. Francis Ngannou, Junior Dos Santos, Fabrizio Verdum, Alistair Overeem, Andrei It's absolutely insane, man. And how many first round knockouts, how many just knockout victories does this guy have? He's also an all-time great of the sport, but he's definitely the greatest heavyweight of all time, 100%. And who Stipe should fight next? It's Francis Ngannou. Only guy he should be fighting. The rematch against Ngannou. 
It's a very dangerous fight. If Francis Ngannou comes out there patient and starts picking at Stipe, working from a distance, Stipe is going to be in a lot more trouble than before because Francis Ngannou rushing Stipe is a lot easier for Stipe to handle after that first round because not only is Ngannou going to gas out, but his punches get a lot more obvious for Stipe to dodge and bob and weave and all that stuff like before. A patient Ngannou is the most dangerous Ngannou, especially one who's countering you. So I cannot wait to see how that goes. And as for the co-main event, Marlon Vera defeats Sean O'Malley by first round TKO. I made a couple videos about this already, but O'Malley got hurt in the fight. His foot was hurt, and first of all, what I gotta say is... I'm glad, in a way, that Marlon Vera took advantage of it, where Andre Sukumtat did not. Still to this day, that leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And just seeing someone actually capitalize effectively on it, now I'm happy, now I'm relieved. Now we don't know exactly what caused Sean O'Malley to hurt himself, but I do believe that it was Marlon Vera kicking his leg. Hitting the peroneal nerve can shut down the foot like that and has done it in the past. It's, it is it is a bit rare to see it happen, right? Everybody gets kicked to the knee and we've only seen this kind of reaction happen a handful of times. So with that point of view, I can be wrong. You know, maybe Sean O'Malley, some people were saying that Sean O'Malley claimed that he was injured coming into this fight. That is a huge possibility because he did look like he was in pain, whereas Henry Cejudo did not. But then again, he was rolling his foot way more than Cejudo was. That could have caused, you know, torn ligaments or something like that in his foot. Who really knows? But we've seen this happen in the past. The exact same sequence with DJ versus Cejudo too. The exact same kick to the exact same spot and the exact same immediate reaction. Just that Cejudo recovered way faster than O'Malley did for whatever reason it is. Either O'Malley hurt himself way more than Cejudo did or just O'Malley's body is not as durable as Cejudo's. But all in all, when you look at that, you look at Marlon Vera being competitive back and forth with the kicks before this happened and then you look at the knockout sequence and it was a knockout sequence. Put him unconscious with that hammer fist after the elbows and Herb Dean came in just in time because Marlon Vera was just looking to land even more hammer fist first hammer fist is the one that knocked him out and he was looking to land more the second one that came after herb dean thankfully got in the way of it that was coming as o'malley was unconscious you know so it, the damage could have been way way worse good on herb dean people were giving him some stuff saying that it was a bad stoppage at first but in hindsight it was a genius of a stoppage like amazing stoppage so we have to give credit to herb dean he's been taking a lot of heat as of late looking back at all of it it just seems like marlon vera beat Sean O'Malley, clearly, just showed to be a better fighter. But ultimately, good performance by Marlon Vera, who's looking now for a top 10 opponent. He got a win over a top 15 fighter. Maybe they could do the rematch with Song Dong. Maybe him versus Marab Vajvili, who also won tonight. Dominic Cruz would be a very interesting fight as well, who's number 11. Rob Font is there. That'd be a fun one. All of those fights make sense. The one I like to see the most, I like to see him fight Dominic Cruz. And I'll tell you why. It would be very smart for the organization to put together this kind of fight because Marlon Vera 100% got some fame or some notoriety from fighting Sean O'Malley and winning at the end of the day. The casual fans didn't really know who this guy was in the first place. He has an interesting look, exciting personality, good skills, man, good fighting style. And they could probably capitalize on this because now there's a drawback for O'Malley. They potentially can build up Marlon Vera in a way, right? He's from Ecuador. He's like the only fighter from Ecuador as well. There's a whole country that can get behind this guy. So him in a high profile fight with Dominic Cruz, they can build up another star in this division, man. So that's the fight I would make for Marlon Vera. And as for Sean O'Malley, probably going to take another, what, seven to nine months off like last time. The division is going to really look different from then. I like to see him fight Song Yedong if that's a potential fight in the future. Then we go to Jarzinho Rosenstrike, knocking out Judo Santos in the second round, 3 minutes and 47 seconds. The fight was back and forth. It looked like JDS, because of his speed advantage and because of his movement and superior boxing skill in the center of the cage, that is, he was just getting the better of Rosenstrike. Rosenstrike really couldn't hit him that clean. There was a lot of leg kicks from Rosenstrike, but ultimately they didn't add up the necessary damage to stop JDS's movement. JDS was landing good jabs, man. Really good jabs, good left hooks over the top but he kept winging their overhand right. Sometimes it looked like Rosenstrike was getting hit by it, but he really wasn't. Only one of them landed pretty clean, and he just ate the punch, man. It just shows the difference of power when you compare Francis Zagano to anybody else. JDS hits hard, really hard, and Rosenstrike ate his punch like he never even got hit by it. But when Francis Zagano hits this guy once, 
he goes out cold forever, like for a long time. But most of those overhand rights from Junior Santos were getting pulled on. Rosestrike was moving with almost all of them and then looking to counter with a tight check left hook. But everything came crumbling down as soon as Rosestrike pressured JDS. The mere moment he pressured him. And I think his corner was calling for him to move on him, get on him. JDS was vulnerable. The same weakness that I've been talking about in my prediction video for years now when JDS is on the defensive when he's moving away he is so much easier to hit because there's no defense and his movement is now trapped he only moves left and right that becomes very obvious and he only throws one punch check left hook that's it he has no guard chin is always there and it was evident Rose's drag just like Cain Velasquez just like Stipe Miocic just like Alistair Overeem just like Curtis Blades Rosenstrike did the same thing and caught him as soon as he pressured him. So it was a good performance of Rosenstrike, the knockout that he needed, the win that he needed, and he has to fight Derek Lewis. I understand we were talking about Derek Lewis versus Curtis Blades last time. Scratch that. Rosenstrike versus Lewis. That is the fight to make. Let's have Curtis Blades, um, what can Curtis Blades do? Nothing really makes sense for him at this point if it's not going to be Derek Lewis. But then again, nothing will make sense for Rosenstrike if he's not fighting Derek Lewis or Curtis Blades. Those three are caught up with each other because they've beaten everybody else who's available. But the fight I want to see, Rosenstrike versus Derek Lewis, that fight would be bonkers, man. That fight would be insane. And to be honest, I think most of us know how Blades versus Lewis is going to turn out. And as for Junior Santos, who's number five in the rankings, going to probably drop a, a spot or two. Him versus Alexander Volkov would be an interesting fight. That's probably the fight to make next. But other than that, I have to catch up on the rest of the fight. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to thumbs up. If you're more content, make sure to subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video.